Buonasera. Good evening and uh, welcome to this session. The title of this session is Between Possible and Impossible, The Charm of Science Fiction. There is a particular charm in this fine line between the possible and this in the impossible. And uh, there is a fine line between what is possible today and what could be possible tomorrow. And what will never be possible even. In this context, imagination, intuition and uh, intelligence, the intelligence of man, play a fundamental role. The possibility, the possible, uh, is our way of thinking about things, a way of thinking and using the reason. Science fiction and uh, science are rooted uh, in this fine line, because on its side, uh, science tries to go beyond itself, going beyond what is known, with uh, knowledge which can be repeated, which is sound, uh, knowledge of the world and what revolves around it. Whereas science fiction is fully connected to imagination, uh, gives a room for imagination and fantasy. This is what we're going to discuss about tonight with our speakers. We are going to talk about uh, uh, the sense of the future and uh, the sense of danger and diversity. Our freedom and uh, our own nature of uh, human beings as opposed to what is not a human, such as a machine or a uh, uh, living being, a living organism coming elsewhere from the universe. And sometimes science fiction can uh, anticipate what science uh, will achieve. This is a fascinating world, and this is what we're going to talk about today with our two guests. So thank you very much for being with us, to both of you. I will introduce them very shortly, because I could say many things about each one of them. Thank you very much to Maria Chiara Canrozza, who is connected with us. Good evening, Maria Chiara. Good evening. Maria Chiara deals with biorobotics at the highest level worldwide. Uh, she uh, lectures at the School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. She was also a chancellor uh, of that school. She is the scientific director of the Don Gnocchi Foundation. And uh, as we all know, uh, she is uh, uh, she was uh, sorry minister for education uh, university and research thank you very much for being with us we're very glad we also have with us uh, uh, sebastiano fusco who is also connected thank you sebastiano good evening he is uh, a journalist he is a science fiction critic uh, he is famous worldwide. Uh, he wrote a lot uh, about uh, uh, science uh, and he deals with many interesting things uh, such as archaeology or history of science uh, as well as history of cinema, for example, and the history of science fiction. He is a great expert uh, uh, in science fiction. And we also have with us Paolo Musso who is here with us. He is a science philosopher and a professor at the University of Insubria. Uh, Paolo uh, has a course uh, called the Science and Science Fiction in the Media and in Literature. So if we want to have a definition of science fiction, we need to ask him. He told me that recently he, uh, he wrote the definition of science fiction for Treccani Encyclopedia. He is also visiting professor of epistemology at the Catholic University of Lima, Peru. And over the past 20 years, he's been involved in the SETI project, standing for a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It is a major international project uh, whose aim 
is to receive any signs from the outer space coming from other civilization or alleged civilizations so to speak i won't waste time because time is precious we don't have much time so let's start immediately with maria chiara whom i will ask the following the progress of science and technology has radically changed the ideas which were impossible where they were uh, conceived at the times. It has proved that some possibilities were not true. In your opinion, what is the relation between science and science fiction? Well, uh, they are very closely intertwined. Oftentimes, uh, science fiction anticipates uh, science, anticipates its evolution, and also anticipates uh, the issues, the problems uh, that uh, science will deal with. Clearly, literature enables us uh, to uh, go deeper into reality and uh, enables us uh, to surf uh, in space without uh, the limits, the constraints of the scientific method and uh, uh, taking us where the scientific method uh, will uh, lead. Robotics is my sector. Today I am dealing with uh, rehabilitation medicine, so robotics applied to uh, medicine. I know that uh, science fiction has attracted many of us uh, to robotics. Asimov, uh, when he wrote, uh, was uh, focusing on engineers who then developed uh, industrial robotics. So there is a very strong link between science and science fiction. We need to take what is good from science fiction and um, we also need to take the ethical dimension, which is uh, an anthropological dimension. Whereby uh, we uh, uh, have doubts uh, on the use uh, and on the possible use uh, uh, of what we have and of what we do. So there's a strong link between the two and for me it was very interesting. For example, looking at Mars exploration, when I've seen a rover that was exploring Mars, I thought that Asimov was anticipating that robots would explore the outer space. So, in the robotics community, I felt a part and parcel of something that was uh, making a dream come true, a true the, a, a, a dream that was anticipated by science fiction, but then science was able to transform it into reality. So Asimov had great intuition, and also uh, Robin had uh, uh, great intuition, where he imagined a close link, emotional link between uh, a baby and uh, uh, her uh, babysitter robot, and the mother is worried for that exclusive link between the two, um, which anticipates uh, one of the most important sectors of today's market, as in robotics for entertainment and social robotics, uh, with the emotional link that can be created. To conclude, in the end, science fiction uh, gives us uh, a choice, the choice of developing a robot uh, as an application which can give a pain or suffering, and on the other side, it, the positive choice of uh, looking at robots and emotional uh, links, not as something disruptive, but as an opportunity for the cognitive support of uh, patients affected by dementia who can uh, draw benefit from the link with the robot that can administer a therapy, for example. So this is a double choice. Here we are at the crossroads. So the point here is the choice, the choice on how to use the potential of science and technology. Technology. Thank you very much for your answer. 
What we are living today is a bit of a science fiction. Now we are talking uh, connected from very far away, and which was not possible some time ago, and this is definitely an opportunity. Now, Sebastiano, I have a question for you. In the world of science fiction, we talk about aliens. This is a sort of symbol of the science fiction, the alien, um, which is uh, something other than us. And therefore, it worries us, uh, and uh, it raises a few questions in us. So our attitude uh, before this unknown uh, other how has it been dealt with in science fiction? And in today's world, what makes the alien, uh, what do you think when we talk about aliens? <coughs> Very interesting question, thank you. There was a great writer, uh, Lacrefts, who used to say that uh, the uh, most ancient and deepest emotion of man is a fear, and the greatest fear is the fear of the unknown. The alien, the unknown, gives us fear because we don't know him. That leads me to a remark. The only antidote, the only solution against this fear is knowledge. In science fiction, this is a very old concept and is rooted uh, in the beginnings of science fiction. In philosophical novels in the 16th, 17th century, uh, the journey was knowledge, uh, a contact with the inhabitants of the sun and the moon meant getting familiar with ourselves and getting to know others meant getting to know ourselves. Ourselves. In science fiction, in films, uh, the first contact with uh, aliens uh, is always a sort of trauma. In uh, uh, 1998, uh, um, with Wills, the aliens came to the Earth, they invaded us uh, to get hold of our planet. And this has always been the case for uh, almost uh, 50 years. Many people uh, will remember that there were uh, black and white uh, science fiction films uh, full of monsters invading us uh, with very bad aliens uh, killing us. Now, that type uh, of stereotype depends on poor knowledge, and that started to change uh, in the early 1950s. <clears throat> Thanks to a very uh, beautiful novel, written by Ray Bradbury, a friend of mine, uh, Mars Chronicles. And uh, it's a people, the human beings, uh, the Americans in particular, are the ones invading uh, Mars. The meeting uh, with uh, uh, the Martians uh, was a trauma because uh, people in Mars uh, disappeared, just few of them remained, and is the very few inhabitants of Mars getting in contact uh, with uh, people from the Earth uh, found an extraordinary way of communicating. These very two different species found out that they had something in common, as in the ability to love. Loving the most beautiful things, uh, the beauty of dawn, uh, wind in the air, uh, the sunset, very simple things. They found out that this was something they had in common. And from then on, uh, they started to uh, get to know each other. Let's not forget that in order to grow, uh, in order to improve ourselves, we only have, have one way to do it, as in the exchange. Exchange with someone which is other than us, someone who knows something different from what we know, someone that can donate us something and to whom we can give something. 
But in order to do that, uh, we need to get to know the other. We need to uh, overcome ignorance, uh, which is the main filter, which is the main constraint, uh, um, preventing the possibility of love, separating uh, um, uh, people and um, uh, enhancing the difference between them. Science fiction has been talking about that for years. There were years where concepts were developed like cross-fertilization uh, between two different races. Uh, large space communities, cooperation for knowledge of the universe. All of these concepts stem from one main concept, one main idea. The one that wins fear can win hatred. And uh, that is knowledge. Only knowledge can win. Only by knowing each other can we appreciate each other and uh, improve ourselves. And this is something that science fiction has been uh, uh, stating for some 70 years. And I'm wondering why science fiction is not taught in elementary school. Well, it's not taught in elementary school, but it is taught in some universities. And this is what really counts. Well, certainly it was not taught in my time when I was in elementary school. Now, Paolo, science fiction often uh, talks about uh, uh, stories uh, which are uh, extraordinary, unimaginable, impossible. And this is an extreme of science fiction. Now, the question is, do you think that science fiction can still say something useful, something true, something interest, interesting for the present time, for our human condition, or maybe is it just a way to uh, evade from life? First of all, thank you for inviting me. Two answers, a general answer, first of all, because uh, science fiction is a narrative genre. There's also uh, anticipation science fiction, as uh, Maria Chiara said, but it's just one part of science fiction. Science fiction, like any genre, uh, tries to uh, tell very interesting stories which are not realistic. There's many science fiction authors who do not know science, uh, like Tolkien uh, uh, uses dragons and uses uh, other characters which are very uh, interesting. But that doesn't mean that science fiction is just a way to evade. Uh, even the Lord of the Rings uh, has a very, uh, as a context that is totally based on imagination, but talks about uh, um, destiny and the human race. Even in philosophy, for example, uh, taking a theory to its extreme is a good way to uh, understand it much better. But there is also another one answer, which is more related to science fiction. The point is, why uh, do we tell stories? Well, we tell stories because uh, by uh, embodying ourselves uh, in the main character, we can experience what is said in the story. Science has taught us that our possibility to experience natural phenomena is limited. not just in, on the Earth, but also in the outer space. Someone uh, went to space, someone went underwater, someone went on orbit, and uh, uh, human beings have just uh, uh, been on the moon. So there's many natural phenomena uh, which are totally extraordinary for human beings, and uh, if we want to deal with them in a realistic way, we can just write an essay but if you want to tell a story, we need to use realistic elements. And I'll give you two examples. 
The film Gravity, which was uh, uh, shown at the meeting a few years ago, there's an astronaut surviving uh, the shuttle disaster. He tries to come back to Earth. He goes from one space station to the other. That was totally realistic, but uh, in the end, the viewer realizes that uh, it has really uh, understood what it means living without gravity. And without that, that wouldn't, it would have been impossible to convey this kind of experiences in such a strong way. Another example is Doctor Who, uh, the science fiction uh, uh, series, uh, the most ancient one. It's the most ancient, the oldest TV series, uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, funny. Uh, it, the Doctor is a key character, is an alien uh, 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 with um, a spaceship that can also travel in time. And once uh, Rosa, uh, his friend, uh, in the year five billions, uh, brings her to uh, see the Earth, which is destroyed. We know that this will happen in five billion years, but no one can experience that. If you imagine somebody that lives for thousands of years, you will never understand uh, what will happen in the future. You will just understand the different events uh, that, in the end, will lead to the same result. And this is a funny story. And uh, therefore, in Doctor Who, uh, mankind has uh, disappeared, has gone to other planets. Some aliens have rented the Earth, have made it and transformed it into an entertainment park, and have blocked the expansion of the sun. But uh, in eight hours, then the the Earth is is destroyed by the sun. Well, uh, this is uh, um, a funny way to tell the story, but at the end uh, uh, of this episode, there is uh, this uh, incredible catastrophe which uh, stay within you. It would, have, it would have been impossible to convey this message with a realistic story. So, in science fiction, impossible the impossible is possible, and paradoxically, it is also necessary in order to talk about uh, real phenomena which otherwise uh, couldn't be told. When is it negative to use the impossible? When someone says that the impossible is real. And my favorite target here is Interstellar, which is a film uh, that is conceived as a science fiction based on science, which is not. It is totally irrealistic. There's nothing bad with that film, but it is wrong to say that uh, that film is something that actually is not. In any case, the science fiction can help us understand reality better. Thank you very much. That's very interesting, Paolo. Now, let's go back to Maria Chiara. We have a certain idea of the future. Science fiction feeds, embodies that idea, just as science. We try to go beyond what is known today. The question is, in your opinion, has the idea of the future changed today? compared to the idea that we had 30 or 50 years ago. As in, are the scenarios of the future different from what we used to think in the past? That's a very difficult question. Thank you for asking me. But it's a difficult question. It's easier to go backwards uh, and uh, to uh, um, remember uh, what we thought 50 years ago about uh, science fiction. 2001 Odyssey in space, this is what we imagined in the past uh, for the relation between man and computers and all the uh, uh, outer space that was imagined in the film. 
that opened up a world that we could imagine uh, thanks to the development of IT systems. And today, this is becoming true uh, because uh, there is a complex relation between us and artificial intelligence. Now, it is uh, more difficult to think about uh, what science fiction is today and what it will be like in the future. There's many different um, uh, ideas on that, and many different perspectives. The science fiction enables us to uh, uh, overcome um, the real reality. We can imagine uh, the future through science fiction, but um, oftentimes science fiction is based on what is real, on projects, uh, and takes this project into the future. I don't know much the situation, not as much as my colleagues, uh, my two colleagues here, but sometimes uh, we have a very negative image of the future. We think about the future uh, where uh, science uh, and artificial intelligence and uh, technology uh, uh, will play a dark role, unknown, which will uh, threaten the human race, which is something I don't like. Because I'm very positive, I'm very optimistic, I'm a researcher, always thinking that it's up to us uh, to choose uh, uh, the option and where we want to go. So uh, artificial intelligence uh, is conceived as something that uh, will overcome human intelligence, whereas artificial intelligence can also be uh, used to develop new treatments, for example. And this is the relation between us, the science, and the future. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is uh, uh, some problems with the connection. I don't think uh, it's, a it's a gravitational field. I don't think we're getting close to a black hole. I think it's just uh, a connection problem. Let's uh, see whether we can solve it fast. I think so, as far as I understand, and I hope so. I um, <clears throat> I would be sorry if we had to stop um, the connection. Okay, let's continue. Let's continue, and hopefully uh, uh, Maria Chiara will come back with us. Now, let's continue. Let's ask a more specific question, which is in line with what uh, uh, we've just talked about with Maria Chiara. Sebastiano, let's talk about the present. It's uh, an odd present today, what we are experiencing. Uh, in very few days, very few weeks, uh, uh, we are now in a sort of uh, uh, situation based on science fiction. All of a sudden, there is a virus uh, blocking everything on the planet uh, with uh, consequences which are still hard to imagine. This is also a topic that has been dealt with by uh, science fiction. So. The, this idea of a global threat which all of a sudden arrives in a silent way but has enormous impacts. In your opinion, what is the uh, attitude of man before this threat, uh, such as this one that we're having right now? Uh, well, <clears throat> science fiction, imagine something like that with extreme accuracy. The first sci-fi novel 
talking about a global epidemic goes back to 1826 and it was written by Mary Shelley and it Im imagines that by 2050 the epidemic of past probably a uh, uh, sort of uh, bacterium stemmed uh, in Asia will then exterminate the world uh, in uh, a lapse of time of 50 years and well it was true for some reason. So the idea of a terrible virus or a terrible disease is a sort of filler ruse. Jack London as well uh, sort of writes about that. In 1912 wrote a work entitled The Scarlet Pest and it looks so much like the coronavirus evolution. It's also interesting to see how the the way of sci-fi writers evolved, especially in the way humankind could fight against such a virus, such an evil virus. For the first 20, 50 years in the history of sci-fi, uh, writers tended to talk about uh, the sort of uh, united spirit uh, of uh, humankind, so getting together around one big country like the US to fight against the virus, so putting together the best brains, the forces, the means, the resources, the strength, in order to find altogether a way to defeat uh, the specific threat, a virus coming from a lab or from outer space, unknown diseases, any possible plague. So. This operating mode used by a whole country or mankind until the genius scientist arrives and finds the miracle solution lasted for 50 years until the mid 50s of the 20th century. And then we started to see the first signs of the crisis of modern society. That means that we had novels describing different ways to fight against the threat. So, and those means were criticized as if politicians uh, started saying uh, absurd things. Uh, instead, the threat we used to increase personal power and uh, the military forces uh, thought that weapons were enough to fight against such a threat and scientists as well did not agree and uh, devised the most absurd speculations with no useful conclusion. Well, does this remind you of something? Well, yeah, this is something that science fiction has been writing about for 70 years. And then there's a movie, actually, that uh, mirrors on a small scale exactly what we're going through now. It's called uh, The Night of the Living Dead by Romero. It was released in 1968 uh, when uh, the Young People Rebellion movement uh, started to see the day. And uh, it is sat uh, in a small house uh, where a group of people find refuge, refuge to f sort of uh, escape uh, a scientific experiment. Uh, a probe coming from Venus uh, has spread all over the Earth uh, a virus uh, that makes people be turned into zombies. Uh, and inside a small house, these survivors, instead of cooperating with each other, they start this quarreling. And so some just go into the cellar, and close them, lock themselves. Others decide to share their own resources but exclude the others. Some uh, look out looking for help uh, and they're dead uh, and they're killed but they all die. Only one person survives and that person was the person that somehow uh, has kept his head, I mean, rational. And it was a black person, by the way. That was a choice by the authors, and the, he wait he waits for help, and help comes uh, under the form of a sheriff, who has created a sort of group 
of uh, armed citizens and they think that uh, the best possible solution is to shoot anything moving and this white sheriff when sees this black guy say hello I'm here please come and rescue me just shoots him in the head and so what's the take a message of all this it's uh, that when you try to face crisis without understanding them and if the only solution is that of locking himself somewhere it's so wrong because that's not the solution the danger threatening us has to be faced you can't hide from that and this is something that our culture has been teaching us so you need to face the reality and the problem because otherwise you will perish so the Iliad teaches us so we need to face a crisis at its roots we need to look into the eyes of danger we need to intervene you need to really sort of uh, face the problems if you build up a wall to hide you just uh, temporarily dodge the problem but you do not solve it you do not fix it this is uh, a sort of teaching that uh, sci-fi has been spreading around since the end of the 60s maybe it would be time to listen to that so Maria Chiara is back with us after a little technical issue. So please, Maria Chiara, go back to what you were saying about the positive image that you seem to get about the future and that you seem to get also from the scientific world about what's going to be with respect to scenarios that instead seem to be rather gloomy. Oh yeah, definitely. I am positive, I think positive, and I think that we have uh, to convey a certain kind of message to young generations following this meeting especially because it's about us to shape the future and uh, our contribution then is important. We can't uh, sort of uh, avoid that if we really want to have a positive future. Science tells us that uh, what we seem to consider as valid today could, also, could always be, I mean, put at stake. So we have outer space, that is a big uh, challenge, and then the brain uh, as a field of study. So doubts are always legitimate according to science. And then what is there more fascinating than uh, the discovery and study and analysis of the brain that sends uh, millions of signals from millions of small cells uh, that are called the neurons and uh, the integration of these synchronized signals uh, results in human thinking. So one of the biggest challenges for the future is to understand how you generate this sort of process. And sometimes uh, science fiction made us think that everything has already been invented and discovered and made, but it's not like that. Much remains to be discovered and done. Well, I now have a question for Paolo and then we're going to have the last round of questions because time flies. We have already heard from you that science fiction touches very deep and authentic feelings that belong to our human nature. And it also talks about the, the value of life and the meaning of life. Well, going back to science fiction, what is the value of the nature of man? This opening up to what is infinite, to infinity, towards the sublime, just to go back to one of the keywords of uh, this year's mating title. 
Well, we have already seen it partially. Very often science fiction is more about man than technology or science. And uh, I'd like to make two examples, two positive examples, by the way, because it is true that uh, we have uh, dystopian visions uh, from the scientific world, but I mean, this is not always the case. So in my opinion, it is very, very important to see at least a couple of encouraging, beautiful and positive examples. The first one comes from the uh, Nathan Never series made by Sera Medevigna and published by Bonelli Editore since 1991 that keeps being published today. I think that this is the most beautiful science fiction comic ever. It's also one of the most beautiful sagas ever. What struck me since the very beginning, apart from the um, artistic quality, is the human conception and uh, of ethics and the, the moral side, because the moral side is not seen and intended as a sort of consistency with principles, but instead it seems to be the tendency to go towards an ideal. And uh, so it's this kind of... Uh, attempt to achieve an ideal so we it's not about cowboys or heroes that do not like heroes it's about normal men that always try to somehow go back to key values like friendship when i talked to uh, Glauco Guardilli, the current curator of the series, when I started the Scienze Fantascienze in Varese, I also met Sarah, the creator, I told them this, and they told me, this is the most beautiful compliment ever, because this is really the message you want to convey through nothing, never. Uh, oh, I was so happy to hear that, and we've made friends in the meantime become big big friends and another comment on the religious side well religion seems to be absent from the scientific the science fiction world it's hard to find descriptions of uh, organized uh, sorts of uh, confessions or religions well we have a sort of uh, example from nothing never historic religions seem to find some space there even though sex, sects seem to be very, very popular when it comes to science fiction, and it's a bit concerning, but still. Well, this is not the key issue, because when it comes to the religious uh, defense, it's not really important, uh, really, the description of specific facts, but uh, it is... Uh, about uh, of, uh, a description of its intrinsic nature. And uh, Sebastian, in particular, uh, wrote uh, wonderful things about uh, religion, like uh, technological mythology. And uh, I'll make another example, taken from Doctor Who. And in particular, the character of Doctor Who. Who is the Doctor? Well, it looks like a human being, but uh, he has a, a superior brain, comes from outer world, and uh, he can instantly appear anywhere, anytime. He's almighty, potentially. He could do anything he wants, but uh, uh, he can die, but if he dies, he will... Uh, come back to life again in a different shape and form. He can save people, he fights against uh, evil, but he never uses violence. He always gets help uh, from uh, other people, and especially people that sometimes are not very much considered. Does this remind you of somebody? Well, I'm not saying that uh, the doctor is an allegory of Jesus Christ, and uh, the doctor is uh, uh, just a mad person uh, with uh, a booth, and that's it. But in the whole history of science fiction and of literature, at any level, 
I challenge you to find another character that has so many traits resembling Jesus Christ. And that was not wanted at all because the authors, well, according to the British tradition, are very much lay people. And so, well, it's a very politically correct series. But the Doctor Who authors are real artists and uh, every real artist is always a prophet of Christ and uh, this applies to many other authors and maybe uh, they declare themselves as uh, indifferent vis-a-vis -vis religion or even hostile but then they can let us understand the religious sense uh, much more than uh, pious authors so I will ask now another very quick question. So please answer quickly for time related reasons. But I think that you already expressed so much interesting content. So all that said and all that that was not said. Which is the secret? of the fascination and charm of science fiction. Why are we so attracted to science fiction? Maria Chiaga, I start with you. To me, it's fantasy because uh, science fiction let us go beyond the, the real dimension, make impossible what seems impossible with a pinch of hope. So, make impossible something that he would like to exist or maybe it's interesting also to uh, sort of make us more aware about possible threats uh, to make us understand what would happen if we were to take a certain direction so fantasy and imagination to go beyond the, the real dimension that's the key element to me Sebastian what's your take well, I do think that uh, science fiction is so fascinating because structurally it is a feminine kind of narrative. It's not, this doesn't mean that authors and readers are women, but it means that feminine qualities are, I mean, at the heart of this genre. It, it is very much fantasy like. It's curious. Look, always looking for something new and always tries to delve into things and to learn. It's the literature, they always try the wonder, the amazement. What can be most beautiful and charming? And it's also a hope based literature that is based on a lot of empathy that relies more on emotions than on rationality. These are key features that the ancient acknowledge in women and they were associated to the nine muses, so the sort of guardians of uh, arts and sciences. The father of Italian science fiction, Giorgio Morricelli, inspired to muse Rainier. Well, if we were to have uh, nine male muses, where would we be now? Do you think that we would talk about science fiction now? Thank you, Sebastiano. Very, very convincing and persuasive. Thank you. Paolo, your take. Well, to me, the charm of science fiction is uh, in the fact that it relies that impossible is the only thing we need. Because even the most impossible stories actually are something that we would really like to be true, something we would really like to experience. We would like the impossible to be possible. We would really like to live those uh, adventures. But at the same time, we know and we understand that alone we can't make it. We need, for instance, Doctor Who telling us come on come on board and let's go and I must say that when I thought about this answer 
I thought about the fact that the mating was born like this because at that time some people who were very young at that time met other people and in particular a person who said come with me and you'll see that the impossible will become possible and it worked and we are still there after more than 40 years so in spite of everything, also in spite of the virus, of the evil virus, and also in spite of ourselves. And this is science fiction, because probably if it were just for us, we wouldn't be here. I thank you very much indeed, all of you, and thanks also to our audience. Thanks for sharing your time. That was such an enriching dialogue. And uh, the take home message is that science fiction is really a very, very nourishing sort of feel. There's a lot to be impressed with, to be somehow touched with, because it's about current situations that are taken to the extreme. It's about our life, but it's like looking into our life through a magnifying lens if we were forced to face the things that maybe no otherwise we would not see it's about for instance the purpose and just the purpose of science and technology well we need maybe through science fiction to be more aware of things especially when we're faced with the possible consequences of things so i think that this is a very very useful exercise and uh, also science fiction forces us to ask ourselves about the future that we want and again this is a question that we have to ask ourselves every day when it comes to the sense and meaning of our scientific activity research activities and so on and as Sebastiano said this is a journey of knowledge and of discovery and of learning but actually it's also a journey inside of ourselves in order to get a better understanding of our nature to understand better who we are and it's about being open on the other and developing a mutual desire and getting to know each other much better well, as you said, Paolo, science fiction somehow pushes everything to the extreme and pushes us to take stock of some specific things. It forces us to think and reflect over things. And that is infectious because then we want to get more. And uh, it's also important to try to be always positive because at the end of the day we always strive for the good i thank you very much again and i hope to see you again sometime to keep on talking about this thank you very much goodbye <laughs>